for your silent auction, how to raise more money for your cause by running your silent auction like a business. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, all attendees are going to be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, the webinar slides will not be distributed, but a video uh, recording will be sent out via email to all, uh, all the registrants. If you have any questions, uh, we do want to hear them, so please type them into the question section of the little toolbar off to the side. Um, and uh, we're going to wait and answer all those questions at the end. Uh, we have some uh, helpers here. I have my marketing assistant, Summy, who's going to be answering your questions uh, as we go along, but she will then uh, post those uh, to us so that we can field them uh, at the end. Be sure to live tweet us. Uh, we have people following along as well. Uh, hashtag silent auction business. Uh, if you have questions, feedback, just want to sh you know shout from the mountaintops that you're having such a good time here, uh, that's how you can reach us. So uh, that is that. My name is Ian Loth. I'm the creative director here at Winspire. We are located in California, all the Laguna Hills. Uh, we've been doing these webinars for quite some time, and we're very happy to uh, to welcome and uh, and have a featured guest here, Harry Santa Ayala, the senior vice president from Givergy. So, uh, welcome, Harry. Thanks, Ian. Can uh, Can you hear me? Okay, I've just unmuted myself. I can hear you just fine. Perfect, perfect, and thank you, everyone, uh, for for joining the seminar. Great. Did you want to give yourself a little bit of an introduction? What is Givergy? Where do you guys come from? I know you, I noticed you have a slight, slight accent. Uh, where, yes. where do you come yeah. from? <laughs> yeah, well, 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 well picked up. Um, <clears throat> as you, uh, the more astute of you will have uh, picked up, that's a London accent, and um, that's where I'm originally from. I've been in the industry now for five years, and I'm senior vice president at Givergy. Um, I uh, sort of hopped the pond, as it were, almost two years to the day um, over here to the to the land of the free and the brave. And um, so here I reside in New York and um, sort of spend most of my time here. And, and we have a couple of offices in the U.S. as well in San Fran and L.A. But uh, I'll go into a little bit more depth on that a little bit later on. But thanks for the introduction and, and thank you all for joining. I really appreciate it. Great. Again, if you guys have any questions, please uh, please let us know, and we'll be uh, addressing those towards the end. So just an overview of what we're going to be covering here today. Uh, how many items should you – it's all about the silent auction here, but generally uh, this also applies to your event as a whole. How many items should you have in your silent auction? Uh, why run your auction like a business? This is super, super key here. Um, how to generate high bids on your silent auction items. How to select your lot items for the auction. Uh, what are some of the favorite items that we're seeing in the industry? Um, of course, why travel sells so well, and then a, a, just a few strategies for how to use travel in your silent auction. So uh, with that, I'll hand it off to you to introduce Givergy there, Harry. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so uh, Givergy, for those who aren't uh, aware of us, we are globally the largest interactive silent auction and pledging system. Um, and uh, you know we'll, we'll be supporting in excess of about 2,000 events in the coming 12 months. Um, <clears throat> we have nine offices globally and, and raised in excess of 70 million. Um, in, in, invariably, it's through silent auctions and pledging events, but um, silent auctions are more or less uh, at 80% of the events we support, which is why I'm excited to be uh, to be part of the seminar today. And um, you know, I will give a little bit of a very, very brief uh, demonstration later on. But um, I just want to let you know that we will be in touch after the event if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about Givergy and and how we can help support your event. Great. And uh, just a little introduction for those of you who are unaware of Winspire. Uh, we specialize in travel experiences for. Uh, uh, charity auctions as well, both the live and silent auctions and raffle items. Um, we've raised in excess of 38 million for nonprofit causes. We've been in tens of thousands of events, 28 over 28,000 uh, globally, and uh, we've serviced over 60,000 satisfied winning bidders. And that those numbers are only going to continue to grow uh, as we grow as well. So uh, the main the main number at the top there is uh, how much money we've been raising for causes. I know Harry uh, feels the same way. That's that's why we're doing this at the end of the day. So. Um, I thought we'd get started uh, off a little bit of interactive poll action here. Wanted to get some feedback from you guys, um, you know, from your experience out there. Just uh, an example. Let's say you are having an event and you're expecting about 300 attendees. What do you think is the maximum number of silent auction items you should have in your auction? 
300 items, one item per person, 150 items, which is about one item per couple, or what we like to call a buying unit, 75 items, which is about half the number of buying units or couples in the room, or 30 items, about 10%. So I'm going to launch this poll. Uh, please uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, right in front of you there, go ahead and submit your answer. What do you think uh, would be the appropriate number of silent auction items? Not talking about the live auction, that's separate, right? Because uh, we, as we all know or should know, if you are having a, a live auction, you should have about seven to ten uh, live auction items. But as far as the silent auction goes, the auction that's going on around the room, uh, how many do, items do you think you should have in relation to your audience size? Because that should really be the the indicator there of how many items you put out. Um, we got some great results coming in. We're going to keep it open here for just a it's few nice, more um... seconds. <clears throat> It's nice to see all of these uh, the the, uh, the the votes coming in because it's right. it's kind of odd sort of broadcasting to hundreds of people and not getting any feedback whatsoever. But it's nice <laughs> to see people are, are at least awake at the moment. Um, there you go. Percent have voted. I'm going to close the poll here. Last chance to get your votes in, and uh, we're going to go ahead and share our results. So as you can see, um, oh look at that! Great people are on it. Uh, we got a majority of people who are absolutely right. Uh, number of uh, correct items to have is about half the number of buying units in the room. So if you think about a buying unit as like one wallet, one couple is about one wallet. You know they tend to spend together, and so you want to have about half as many items um, as buying units in the room. So uh, that that was uh, very enlightening. So that's great. Um, as you can see here, we have the answer up: uh, 75 items for 300, and that that applies. Uh, no matter how many attendees you have, you always want to focus on how many attendees you have and then split that number in half. You might have some single people coming who aren't as couples. You know, you can count those as one buying unit, but you always want to have half the number of um, uh, items as buying units in the room. So with that, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to Harry here very soon, but I just wanted to open it up uh, and just talk a little bit about why it's so important to run your silent auction like a business. Because at the end of the day, these events, it's, you can't think about it like a charity. You can't think about it purely in terms of donations. What you are trying to do is run a business and create a profit in one night, right? And in order to do that, you need to stop thinking like a charity and start thinking like a business. Whereas a business, you know, a charity is, you know, please, you know, you're you're asking for donations. Can you please support us? Can you please help? You are now doing a profit-making endeavor. You are thinking like a business. You need. Uh, you should think about it as if you are doing a one or a, a, a business storefront, right? You're opening a store. You spend all year preparing for this grand opening of this store, uh, where you're packing the shelves with products and and ways where people can come into your store and spend money. And 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 then for one night, you have those customers file in through the door. They have to buy all those products and leave at the end of the night. And that's all. You only are open for one night out of the year. That is a. If you ask me, that's. A tough business to run, but it's very much a reality in, in terms of what you are tasked with doing. So, in order to do that, you really, really have to hone your skills and think about everything that you're doing in terms of profit, right? Because that's what business is all about. And with these charity events, you are trying to seek a profit. And in order to do that, um, to increase your profit, you need to increase the amount of revenue you're making at the event, and you need to decrease expenses in as many ways, shape, or forms. This is the model for how businesses operate, and this is the model that you should be operating when you are, are planning your event. So in order to do that, you have to make sure that every single piece of, of your agenda, every single piece of your event has a focus on fundraising, has a focus on making money. If there's something that you're doing in your event that isn't making money, like if there's, there's an entertainment piece, uh, which are great, but if, there's, if maybe you have someone get up and do a performance in the mic, what, what is that going to lead to? Is there going to be some sort of ask at the end of it that's going to result in, in making money? As a charity, when you are running an event, uh, a charity auction event, you need to make sure your focus is on fundraising and you are generating that profit. And I'm sure you see this uh, time and time again with the events that you're running, uh, Harry. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think you're sort of spot on there. There's, um, there's a, a huge amount of um, you know, considerations to, to take into account. Um, but one of the most important things that event planners, in my experience, kind of lose track of the night of an event is that uh, the silent auction is very often one of your biggest revenue generators. So 
you know, getting caught up in, uh, in in other sort of troubleshootings and so on, which typically happens at every single event. Um, you know, the bottom line is you, you, you hit the nail on the head. That window for sales is very, very slim. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would agree. I mean, I think that the silent auction is is one of the most important parts of of how you're going to generate this revenue because it is. Um, it is those products that you're putting out. Um, it's what people are going to be, you know, actually spending their money on. You have the live auction, you have the ask, uh, but then there's the silent auction, which are what you spend most of your time procuring throughout, you know, throughout your I planning process. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did you go? Did you go dark there for a second? Yeah, for some reason I did. At what point did I drift off? <laughs> you know, um, you were talking about how silent auction is the the most. Uh, one of the most important revenue generating aspects of the event. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if I could just quickly share my screen, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, change it over to you here. Hold on. Uh. All right. So can you can you see my screen? Okay, Ian. I Ashley? can. Fantastic. Um, so this very quickly, um, you know, one one of the most important aspects of um, of a successful silent auction will actually be um, getting your guests engaged and excited by the auction items, and that's not just um, you know at the event itself. And I'll talk a little bit in, in, in more detail about how you can get. Uh, more people attracted to to bidding on your science auctions pre-event as well. But this here is a typical leaderboard that we would encourage all of our our uh, clients to display around the rooms. Where would this be displayed? Like on a big uh, like big screen up in front of. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it kind of does depend on the format of the event. If it's sort of yeah. quite a transient event, and people are, if it's just a cocktail reception or an art exhibition or something, people are typically moving around. So you know, as long as screens are visible to people, um, you know, that's great. The, the reality is, the vast majority of gala dinners are sat down galas with sort of tables of ten. You've just got to be mindful of the fact that people are sat all around the table. So having screens in all corners of the room will will um, certainly add value. Um, so you. Can see here. This this is just a typical leaderboard, and I use a, a client of ours, Echo, as an example. Um, it'll all be branded in line with your event and your your uh, your um, organisation. This is basically displaying all of the items and who's currently winning. So instead of having sort of bidding sheets at the back of the room, uh, people can see who's winning and by how much. Um, and I'm just going to quickly place a bid now on a trip to the Bahamas because uh, that's something I'm. I'm in desperate need for. Um, <laughs> just give me two seconds. Yeah. And Demi all. Um, I'm just going to spend three thousand dollars very quickly on on this trip, and you'll see now very quickly. It's, there's going to be a, a. It'll flash up around the screen. Um, you know, as to who the highest bidder is, um, and you can see now the ultimate. Um, the ultimate Las Vegas escape. The current minimum bid is two thousand eight. $150. Oscar Lacey is winning the uh, 10 nights at the, the uh, Park Hyatt in the Maldives. Um, and the bid I just made under Jake Carlin is going for 2500 We can also have pop-ups around the room uh, letting everyone know, you know as and when those bids are flooding in. And that's via mobile or via tablet. So I'll... Um, I'll I just I'll want to show, I just want to make a point here too, then just in terms of this idea of, you know, always looking for ways to generate more revenue. I mean, you, I, I noticed you got the branding up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, sponsorships, uh, huge branding opportunities. Whenever you have screens up around the room, um, you know, and you're selling these sponsorship levels, right, whether it's in your program or whether it's, you know, you have a PowerPoint um, or whether you have something like uh, a bidding uh, technology like Givergy is showing here, there's so many opportunities for branding and sponsorship uh, to say, hey, we can get your, your name, your logo uh, up in these places. And, and that's, you got to think about this as if you are, uh, you're, you're, I'm going to put it in terms that I understand really well, like an NFL game, right? You have advertisers anywhere, be it any sport, right? Uh, you see advertising everywhere. They're selling those spots, right? And those are, rem those are revenue generating uh, sources. And so you always got to be on the lookout for ways that you can do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so if you want to just grab the screen back, I can talk through a few more points as well. No problem. Great. 
So obviously, you know, that the leaderboard that I was just showing you and the various ways in which people can engage with the silent auction is one, one you know, aspect of consideration. And I'm obviously slightly biased towards technology and there's, um, <clears throat> I'm more than happy to sort of talk through how, how we can support you as individuals um, another time. But it's also important to focus on, you know, things like the MC um, at the event. You know, having a strong MC that has a real understanding not just of who's in the room, uh, where the spending power is, uh, but is also keeping tabs on sort of which items should be selling for hire. Um, you should be feeding your MC with information of, of what items are slightly dropping behind, um, which which items have got you know multiple bids on to to try and encourage people to get involved. Um, and, also, and, you, uh, and an MC should also be a, a, a certified benefit auctioneer specialist, right? You want it to be a, an auctioneer who knows how to work a room like that, as opposed to just an MC who likes to hear their voice, right? Like a news yeah. broadcaster, or you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I've been to you know, I've, I've been to hundreds of these events, and right. what is very, very evident to me, and is completely out of my control, is just simply a vendor to clients, is that um, there is a huge difference between you know a TV personality or or someone who typically can speak confidently, um, which right. is one thing, and perform well. Um, there's a big difference between someone like that and someone who actually is a, a, a professional fundraiser that can really harness the power in the room and, and make the most of what's available to them. And, um, you know, they've, they're very often very quick, powerful sort of messages um, from the MC. They're usually quite funny, um, but at the same time, you know, they are they are genuinely making the most of, of the spend capacity in the room. Another right. thing to sort of focus on um, in terms of attracting higher bids is, is what's available outside of the event. So not just who's in the room. Um, you know, it's great to have, you okay. might have, uh, have 300 guests, um, you know, attending the event itself, but you might have a database of thousands of supporters that want to be able to support your organization, organization through, um, you know, through your um, silent auction, but they may also want to give pledges or, or anything. And we, you know, using mobile technology these days, you know, Gibbet Mobile, for example, allows people to be bidding from outside of the room and they'll get alerted as and when they get, the, you know, they bid and outbid each other. And, you know, if I could be bidding from here and, and, and my name would be flashing up on the screens in an event in London. Um, and also okay. to make the most of, of what's available to you in terms of the, the, the data, so like lots without bids. You know, I talked about it earlier with the MC, but you know, functionalities they can they can just make that that whole process as a guest, as a user experience, it's easy as possible. So a lot of people are price sensitive, particularly these days. Um, and you know, typically they want to know right which are the items without any bids. Um, so making the most of whichever sort of fundraising technology you're using, or um, or, or or any vendor in, in, in actually um, will, will really help attract bids to the auction. And and once you've got bids going, more often than not, they're very self-managing. Actually, once you've got people sort of interested in the auction. And um, once they've started bidding, you know, I'm, I'm sure plenty of you have placed bids at, at, at various events, but potentially even your own events, you, you are always monitoring them. Even if you haven't got technology at the event giving you live sure. updates and so on, you know, you're always got one eye on, on, on how you're doing in that auction. So our role as professional fundraisers and is to make sure we get those first bids in um, to stimulate that interest. Absolutely, and everything that we're talking about today, you know, applies whether it's you know with bidding technology, if you're you know kind of adopting these new forms of of uh, a bidding, or or if it's just a traditional bid sheets. You know, you just it's all about eyeballs. It's all about facilitating and and, and guiding people towards those items. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, you know having it up on a screen and and having people doing it from their phones, or having a a professional benefit auctioneer who knows how to guide people appropriately to the items, and how, when to close sections and things of that sort. I, I, I had a question for you, Harry. How, uh, do you ever? Um, how do you guys coach people on closing sections of their silent auction? Do they? Um, do you ever see that, especially with uh, technology, bidding technology? Yeah, we. I, I actually sort of encourage people not to, to to close out in sections because although we would absolutely love all of our guests to be sort of um, running, you know, uh, running to our sort of timeline and 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 following all directions, we know that that's just 
not realistic. Um, right. So you need to keep things as simple as possible. And in our experience, when we've closed closed aspects of auctions, you know, um, at different stages, it can confuse guests, and understandably, they're distracted by all the various things going on at the event. You know, that, that's mm -hmm. kind of part of the the reason they're there is to catch up with friends and sort of you know, see, you know, enjoy the program that you've invested a lot of time, energy, and money putting on. So, you know, keeping it as simple as possible will yield the best results in our experience. And what you don't want, which can happen, is by closing different areas of the auction down at different times, some people might get confused and think they've won an item that they haven't, and, you know, maybe they've, they've seen a closeout. Um, but the area that they're interested in is still open, and they, you know, may you know, head to the restroom or head outside right. or something and then miss out on winning that item. And I have seen that right. before. Um, and that's, you know, you don't want to be dealing with angry uh, angry guests at your events, that's for sure. Totally. Totally. And just to put, I mean, I, I'm going to put it out there just, you know, just sort of an opposing view. And it, it might it might just uh, be more uh, applicable for non-bidding technology situations where it is traditional bid sheets. But I have heard of, you know, a certain best practices or, or just practices out there. Uh, for those of you who've joined us with Danny Hooper on some of our previous webinars, you know, he will, if it is just traditional bid sheets, he will um, encourage nonprofits to have different sections but make sure they are clearly marked so people aren't confused and uh, and maybe have, uh, you know, but not too many sections so it's not too confusing. I totally agree with Harry. It should be very, very simple. But you know, having certain sections close out to create compression on, on specific items that you want to drive bidding up. But again, that could be very different for a situation where people are able to bid from wherever they are in the room. Uh, you know, it may, might not make as much sense to uh, to close sections out. So uh, you know, it totally depends on the situation. Uh, you know, what your situation is, but I think um, you know both can both can be applied. Yeah, so, absolutely. Cool. Let's see here. Moving on. So as far as how are selecting your lot items, Sarah, did you want to take this one? Yes. Um, so in terms of selecting the lot items, um, you know, each event is is completely different, um, and I think for me the most important, you know, the the most important thing when selecting items is to is as a committee to go in with a very open mind. Um, you know go in thinking about not just what appeals to you um, or indeed to those that are attending the event. You know, don't just focus on the demographic present at the event. Think about what will be appealing to um, you know, as presents for the children or the you know the, the parents of those attending your event. Um, you know it's actually it's amazing how resourceful people can be when they really put their mind to it as a committee when when selecting items um, or even you know sourcing items in and um, you know the bottom line is of course you want to maximize your return and you want huge bids coming in for items but what you also want is actually a lot of participation you want everyone to feel a part of the event um, you, you know, the, you, you want different items that are going to appeal to different price points. Um, you, you know, the, the bottom line is if you have sort of young professionals at the event uh, that aren't in a position to be spending tens of thousands of dollars of trips to the Maldives, I'm sure we'd all love to go, but mm -hmm. it, it's, not, <laughs> it's not so fun if you're just the guy who's spectating. Um, on, on, on people bidding. It's, it's very similar to why live auctions these days are becoming you know smaller and smaller. People are recognizing that people aren't necessarily enjoying um, being a spectator at these events. So be mindful of the fact that you you know you want to have a really wide variety of price points, a really wide variety of appeals as well. So you want to have some some experiences, some arts, um, you want to make sure that um, you're forecasting as well. That's something that Ian and I uh, have talked about, you know, offline, um, and uh, you know, I'm sure um, he'll talk about it in a, a little bit more depth. But you know, think about when your event is actually taking place. If it's mm -hmm. five months down the line, um, you may not be thinking about the Super Bowl right now. But the reality is, if your event is happening around that time, 
you know, think ahead, you know, try and get hold of some tickets or something because, you know, you can harness the power of what the world media is doing and, and get it in, in getting hype towards it. Or, you know, I, I often sort of talk about Wimbledon tickets, that sort of thing. When it, when Wimbledon yeah. comes around back home in the UK, you know, people will do almost anything for those tickets. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, you know, when people are planning events for June, you know, in November, they're not necessarily thinking about Wimbledon, um, and there's always that sort of aha moment at at the event when they're like, oh, I wish I'd actually thought about, you know, getting something or or, or signed tennis rackets or anything that's sort right. of surrounding, you know, that sort of sporting occasion, the Olympics, that sort of thing. Forecasting ahead, it, what you're it, talking it about. makes a massive difference. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to touch on one thing. You know, it's all about that perceived value, and what you just talked about. Is, I love what you just said, Harry. You said people will do almost anything to get those tickets. You know what that means for you as the event organizer? That means they will spend a lot of money to get those tickets, regardless of their value, right? What we're talking about is perceived value. If you were to try to sell, you know, those tickets and, you know, uh, Super Bowl tickets in the summer, the perceived value might not be nearly as high as halfway through the football season or, get, you know, as we get closer to the Super Bowl, the perceived value can go through the roof depending on the time of year and the relevancy of your, of your auction items. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, cool. So Did should you we have anything else you want to touch I, on? That? No, I think um, I think I think that's pretty much it. The only thing I, I did mention is how resourceful committees can be when they really put their mind to it, and that sort of challenge each other to you know to be sourcing five items each or something, and reach out to close family and friends and so on. People might be willing to give sort of days' experiences in in interesting workplaces or you know things that aren't necessarily you know thinking outside of the box adds real value in two ways. One. It's because you're adding more items to the auction, but but two, because a lot of the time when you're drawing off the experience or or contacts of of friends and family, very often you're getting experiences that money can't buy, that you can't just go online and purchase. Um, and so, um, you know, in 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 my experience, that that you know, the most resourceful committees are the ones that really sit down, challenge each other to make the most of every contact they have, not just blanket emailing their supporters saying, you know, can you help with a house in the Maldives or something along those lines. Right. No, all, all great points. Uh, and you know, one good way that you can think outside the box, or at least try to, um, with your committee, because it can, be, I mean. Sitting down and, and looking at a blank piece of paper and trying to come up with ideas is, is not the way to go about it. Uh, one of the best things you can do is actually get your committee together um, outside of your organization, you know, and then have a little procurement party or a wish list party. Um, and again, this would be kind of in someone's home, in someone's living room. Um, maybe you know, open up a bottle of Chardonnay. You know, bring food there. Really get the get the atmosphere a little bit more lighthearted, and then start brainstorming. Right? Just start throwing around ideas. Get out your Rolodex, everyone has their smartphones there, and just start going down your contact list and, and thinking about what sort of connections you, you have. It, it, it's amazing the connections you can start to come up with when you actually start looking at the names in your contact book, right? So-and-so, you know, your neighbor, your friend, they might have this sort of connection. And then once you start verbalizing that and writing things down, get a nice big whiteboard, right, get, uh, from, you know, uh, Office Depot and, and get some Expo markers and just start writing things down. It'll be, you'll be amazed the sort of connections you'll start making with everyone else in the room and say, and then you can kind of attack each of the, and then you can create a plan. You can attack each of these ideas, you know, kind of have a two-pronged approach. If you both, you know, there's two people in the room who know of this kind of, uh, Possibility, you can both, you know, figure out ways to go go get that. The, the most important part here is just to get together, do it in a lighthearted uh, manner, and make sure you write everything down. Um, that we've seen some great out of the box thinking come come from that. Cool. So moving on here, favorite items in the industry. What what sort of things do you see out there, Harry? You go to a lot of events. Yeah. Um, I mean in. <clears throat> Again, in my experience, and the you know a bit of a no-brainer, the the money can't buy type experiences will always be, um, you know, really sought after experiences that you can't just go online and sort of book for yourself. 
Um, you know, also this uh, gone are the days where sort of ten or so years ago, or, or, or even longer, you know, people were willing to to throw money at sort of kind of needless, ass, you know, items, things like sort of signed baseball bats and so on, just to sort of be seen supporting the organisation. Um, but at the same time, getting a little something in return. People aren't necessarily that, you know, they're a little more fickle with their with their money now. They're they're they're, um, they're looking more for an investment. And so we're seeing that you know prints, artwork, that sort of stuff sells very well because you know the perceived value is that you know ultimately it is an investment and and they are going to retain their value. Um, and that's why also trips um, and experiences you know people do you know they are happy to purchase those uh, th those lot items because they're getting something in return. It's not mm -hmm. just sort of signed memorabilia that they've seen at a number of other events um, that, that that aren't necessarily adding real value as an investment. That's so true. Yeah, and I mean it's I mean it's part of the reason why I mean it's why Winspar went into business is because um, and you know to help nonprofits but with travel because it is such a good you know uh, item for for these sort of auctions and 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 it sells so well uh, because it is unique and because uh, people want to experience life through travel you know you hear kind of hear these days people are you know especially in the millennials group that's uh, up and coming you know uh, millennials especially they're they're less interested in purchasing things they're more interested in, in purchasing experiences things they can share with their friends share on Facebook share on Instagram um, so travel is that because it is it will always be new, unique. There's an infinite number of places and, and experiences that you can uh, cobble together and, and include in your auction, and, and people will ultimately pay top dollar for it because of the perceived value there. It's really hard to put a specific price tag on, uh, you know, a, a, a trip with an experience uh, versus, you know, a flat screen TV. It's because, you know, there's all these things put together in a package. Uh, people are inevitably going to spend more money for that uh, just because you know in the moment because you know they want to go the perceived value is there so I want to talk just real briefly here today a little bit more about why travel sells so well um, and it's it's why we're seeing it more and more events as time goes on and that that means the same for your silent auction you can still have travel in your silent auction uh, you may not want that higher price point you may want a little bit of a lower price point for for the silent auction uh, but it should still definitely be there because it's going to get some bidding activity um, but yeah travel you know it, it sells because it's unique as I said before there's there's just an infinite number of places you can go it's popular everyone loves to travel and there's also a budget for it and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second but just how popular is travel? Well, we do survey each and every winning bidder that we've sent on trips in these last, you know, eight years or so, and that that means almost 4,000 winning bidders that we've we've surveyed. And of those we've surveyed, two thirds of them say they tri take at least three trips per year. That's three trips that they're going to be taking regardless um, of going to your event. They could be doing it, purchasing it through your event or through a travel agent. But even more absurd is that 15% of these winning donors take six trips per year, which I would love to take six trips for a year, but that's just not in my budget. But the fact of the matter is, is there's a sizable chunk of these winning donors who are traveling a ton, right? They are going to be going on trips um, one way or another. They just vacation a lot, and so why not have them be purchasing uh, those trips through your event? Um, especially because, you know, a vast majority of Americans in general actually have a travel budget. So this is a, this is a budget, I know all of you out there, when you're, planning your event right and you're thinking like a business you are targeting that philanthropic budget that these people these donors uh, your constituents right are setting aside to donate f to charity right whether it's your charity or, or or some other they have this this other this budget that they're setting aside for these sort of events well, there's this whole other budget that uh, that they set aside for travel right and this is uh, this is generally this is Americans uh, excuse me this is all just gen Americans in general American Express travel uh, this is their stat 58% say they actually set aside money. Well, how much? Last year alone, there was $600 billion sent on leisure travel, right? That's huge, and it's, it's really our goal here at Winspire uh, to, to help you kind of funnel some of that $600 billion uh, that people are spending on travel anyway towards your nonprofit cause. Going back to those winning bidder uh, surveys that we've uh, been performing, 82% of the winning donors that have, we've been sending on trips budget at least $5,000 a year, 82%.
That is most, if not almost all of them, right? And that's, I mean, that's $5,000 that could be spent on uh, a package at one of your events, all right? Uh, on top of that, 55%, that's still a majority, right? That's still most people of these winning donors budget $10,000 a year. Again, I would love to have a $10,000 travel budget myself, but unfortunately I do not. But these donors, your audience one members, one day, right? Yeah, dare to dream. But uh, these folks that you guys are targeting, right, with these auction items uh, and with your storefront, your one-night-only storefront, they have money to spend on travel, right? This isn't that philanthropic budget. This is that travel budget that they uh, could be spending at your event. So if you want to use travel, um, you should be out there procuring it. And that's one thing that we always tell our, uh, you know, the people that we work with, you know, we provide travel, but we also want you out there looking for these experiences in your local community. You should be, um, you know, looking for uh, travel, uh, maybe like airline tickets you can cobble together and put with uh, packages. Um, the fact of the matter is, is you should be trying to procure everything under the sun. But the fact, but at the end of the day, you really, really want to have good concrete pa travel packages that you can sell that have that really high perceived value. But, but travel inherently is risky, right? You have no idea the people that are going to bid on it, when they're going to want to travel, how they're going to want to travel, and you as the organizer, the last thing you want to do is after the event to play travel agent, right? It's, it's a risky proposition, and uh, there's a classic example that we always like to cite, and it's, and it's a pretty familiar scenario, right? You've got your board member here who, uh, you know, they've been donating their vacation uh, home for you know, the last three or four years. Uh, it's been going great. It's been raising you money, and then all of a sudden, one year, somebody pays you know three thousand bucks to use it for a week, and when they go to book, it's sold, or it's under renovation, or this thing, or that thing. For some reason, they can't use it when they want to use it, and then it becomes a huge headache for you uh, as the organizer to try to, to try to manage to this uh, at the end, you know, at the end of the day. And this is time that you should be spending planning your next event and procuring items for your next event. You don't want to be playing travel agent at the, uh, you know, on the back end. And that's, you know, that's where we came from. That's where Winspire came from and why we do this no-risk uh, travel, where not only do you not have to pay to put it in your event, you only pay what sells and what you raise money on, but we handle all of the booking and all of the white glove treatment for your winning bidders at the end, so they come back raving and looking for more and new travel packages every single time they come back to your event, right? They're like, oh, when's, you know, I want to bid on another travel package because that last one was fantastic, right? That's, that's our whole ethos here. That's what we're trying to do. So you've decided to use travel in your auction. How are you, how, what are some of the best ways to use it, uh, specifically in your silent auction? Well, and Harry kind of touched on this in the beginning, the most important thing you should, could be doing is to know your audience. Right? Make sure you know the people that you're going to be putting these uh, auction items out for. Right? One of the best ways you can do this is to survey your guest list. Where do you want to go? Harry, where do you want to go? Where, where would your ideal vacation spot be? I'd be, uh, I'd be interested in uh, that trip to the Maldives I was, uh, I was betting on earlier. <laughs> Maldives, I hear, is, is insane. It's expensive, but it's insanely nice. Yes, I would agree. Um, I know I want to go to Bali. I think uh, my fiance and I are looking at Bali for for a possible honeymoon. So I know I'd be bidding top dollar for for that. But these are, this is information that you can gather from from your audience. It's very easy to send out a you know a free survey that you can create on maybe Google surveys or SurveyMonkey. Send it out in an email and try to get some information on people. You can contact your VIP donors, right? Your your big wigs, the people who you know are going to be bidding during the live and silent auction. See where they want to go, because you know what they bid on, other people are inevitably, excuse me, inevitably going to bid on as well. And that, that ties right into what I was going to go into next, pre-promotion. You've got to condition your bidders to bid on travel. Right? If people come to the event and they have no idea what's going to be there, and all of a sudden there's this $5,000 package that uh, you know, they're going to expect it to bid on, if, you know, husband and wife are going to sit there and you know, say, oh, should we do it, should we do it? No, you want that conversation to take place, you know, days if not weeks before. How do you do this? You can send out email campaigns. Uh, you can send out, uh, you know, uh, direct mail campaigns, highlighting some of the incredible packages, travel um, experiences that you're going to be at your event. You know, then that conversation will take place before they even get there, and they're going to come primed and ready to bid. And that is huge because the more people you have come primed and ready to bid, the higher those bids are going to go. Setting a minimum bid, uh, this is crucial because you want to make sure, right, you're running a business here, 
For one night only, you want to ensure yourself a good return. If it's donated items, uh, try to figure out the value, and you can start maybe around like 30, 40% of uh, the retail value, maybe, maybe around 50%. If you have consignment items, like those we provide here at Winspire, a good rule of thumb is to, to set the minimum bid 20% over uh, the nonprofit price. So that way you're ensuring yourself a good solid 20% return. That means if it's a $2,000 travel package, you're going to return 400 bucks if one person bids, right? Uh, but hopefully, if that's your minimum bid, it's only going to go up from there. Right, and that that'll that'll be amplified even further if you sell the packages multiple times. That's another really good thing about using consignment travel or no risk travel. Is you can sell any package as many times as you want, and that's really where you start to see your big returns. How do you do that in a silent auction? Well, uh, you have that trip out there. You get you start to see bids on the on the bid sheet, uh, or maybe you have it uh, you know in uh, the, the Givergy uh, you know mobile bidding technology. Then what you can do is you can actually go, if you have, let's say, five or six bidders, you can go pick the top two and, and reduce the top bid down and go say, hey, can we give it to both of you for, for this, this reduced price? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you sell two, you've automatically doubled your return, right? And if it's a $3,000 package that sells for $4,000 and you, uh, you instead sell it for, to two people for $3,800, instead of making 1000 bucks, you've made 1600 right? 800 times two. That's, so that's actually... One of those a Go great ahead. point to make, actually, Ian. I don't, sorry if I'm jumping no, in. Totally. You know, making the most of that data live, particularly on the night, because um, you know you you are hopefully you know building a an environment where where people are enjoying competing for items and and that healthy competition is breeding some great results. But the bottom line is having that live information, something that you know give, give you will provide on the night. You can see all of the underbidders when they were outbid and how mm. much they were outbid by, and you can utilize that data right there and then capitalize on the night while the the wine's still flowing and right. everyone's still in the mode of like let's do this trip to the Maldives which I'm desperate to have um, you know you can, <laughs> you can you know tap them up and say look I just saw that you, you were actually only outbid by $200 in the, fi in, in the final you know the dying seconds if you're interested in you know the trip if you're happy to match the, the winning bid we have actually got the availability for, for that same item and I've, I've you know on the night it obviously adds it, it's fantastic to, to sort of capitalize on that live and use that data you know on the night but also post event I've seen I've seen um, you know uh, there's one absolutely one post event for sure Absolutely, you know, getting in touch with underbidders and and reaching out to them, just saying, look, by the way, we saw you, you know, you bid several times on this item and you narrowly missed out at the end. We have actually been able to source, you know, the same item. If you're interested in in uh, booking a trip, then you're you're more than welcome to to match the winning bidder. As long as you're matching the winning bidder, then it's you know it's ethically absolutely fine. I I, I personally believe. Totally, yeah, and you can also, I mean, it's also in your best interest, even if you were to. Um, Say you know if it's only 200 bucks that you're talking about, you can give 200 dollars to the the actual winning bidder, right? And say, hey, you know we're going to sell this to another the, the second highest winning bidder. Uh, here's 200 dollars back, and then you know you, you've still doubled the uh, the revenue, right? Because you're selling it to two people instead of one, and uh, you end up making more, right? Um, we've seen people definitely do that as well. Although if you can get them to round it up. Right, you always want to try that first. Right? Um, but there's, as far as selling multiples go, you know, you can also you can also create group experiences out of any any of the trips, any of our trips. Like uh, we've seen it before, where entire tables, um, you know, will want to go to Napa Valley. We know that notice that the, the the bidding is happening at a single table, and we say, you know what, hey, how about all eight of you, you know, all eight couples? Why don't, why don't we put it all together? And if you all eight buy, then you you can do it at this price. So they all say, I, 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 boom. Now you've just sold the same package eight times. And you've, I don't even know how, quadruple, centuple, I don't even know what that's called. But you get the idea here. You can sell it many, many times and, uh, and end up amplifying your revenue dramatically. Cool. Last tip here, and then we're going to move into Q&A. Um, securing underwriters. This is probably the biggest and best tip we can give you. You've are, you're already securing underwriters for your event, whether it's the table linens, the wine, the cooking, the band, whatever it may be. I know that you're, you're you know, soliciting businesses or individuals out there and trying to get certain aspects of your event paid for. 
one of the best things you can get paid for are auction items, are especially your travel experiences, because what it does is it opens up an opportunity for you to recognize donors, right, in the live auction or the silent auction. You can say, hey, you know, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, for donating this trip, this incredible trip to the, you know, ultimate Hamilton Broadway experience. Uh, you know, thank you so much. We're going to start the bidding, and that, not only do the, the all the proceeds go uh, to you now. But also, you've recognized and uh, donors and given you know another opportunity for them to be uh, highlighted. So that's just a huge tip that we're seeing more and more uh, out there. Is just getting auction items, especially consignment items, big travel experiences underwritten. Cool. And with that, um, those are the tips that we got for you as far as silent auction goes. Did you have anything to add, Harry? No, I think uh, we covered, covered a lot of it. And um, the only thing I would say, from a fundraising perspective, uh, which of course you know many of you are, you know, when, when people have been sort of outbid and and it's past their sort of comfort zone in in, in terms of uh, you know spend capacity, you, you still want to try and get something out of them. So it is worth encouraging the MC to say, look, for those who have got involved in this silent auction. Uh, but I've narrowly missed out, you know, please do donate something, uh, you know, by the pledging option and, and, and so forth. So you're trying to, you know, touch base with everyone in terms of fundraising. But from a silent auction perspective, you, you hit some amazing points there, Ian. And, um, you know, the, 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 I'm just looking forward to seeing what the questions are. Great. Yeah, we, we actually didn't get, haven't gotten too many here today, but um, we just got a couple. One for you. Uh, what do you mean by bid? And for those of you who are still joining us here, please, um, if you have any questions about anything that we've been covering today, uh, you see in the, their little panel, go to webinar control panel, there should be a little questions pane uh, there where you can submit questions. Uh, we'd love to answer them, so uh, please don't hesitate to submit them. Uh, one here for you, Harry. What do you mean by bid outside the room? Does that mean you can bid off-site through Givergy Mobile and not be physically at the event? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of our clients are using mobile bidding technology, uh, which means um, that you know they're not just utilizing the tablets on the tables around the room, and people are engaging with the uh, with the auction, you know, inside the room. It means that anyone can be bidding from anywhere around the world. And I'm actually victim to the success of this platform <laughs> myself because we have, uh, you know, we'll be we'll be supporting 450 events in November alone, and I know that almost every Christmas present I buy will be via one of our auctions in London. Um, cool. And it's huge here in, uh, in in the U.S. This mobile technology, and one of the points we both actually touched on is getting you know getting that auction stimulated before the actual event itself. You know, getting a couple of weeks of of mm -hmm. bids and outbidding uh, you know going because, like I said, once people have started bidding. Uh, the likelihood is they're going to continue because, you know, especially with the mobile platform, you're getting alerts letting you know when you have been outbid. So people don't actually have to go to the back of the room and find the bid sheet and so forth. They can they can quite literally just sort of, you know, bid from from wherever they are just via their cell phone. Very good, very good. Uh, is it appropriate? Uh, this oh, and that question. Uh, sorry, let me uh, see who that. Uh, that was from uh, Katie Brownstone. Thank you for submitting that. Uh, this one's from uh, Hannah Lafur. Uh, is it appropriate to ask people after the event if they want to bid on a multiple of an item? What do you think, Harry? Um, I think you need to tread carefully here, if, if I'm oh. honest, um, because what I don't, you know, you. The, the, the reality is you don't want to put anyone's nose out by um, you know in, encouraging this fun and engaging sort of auction that's that's uh, that people are competing in on the night only to then sort of turn around to people and say oh by the way we've got multiple of these so I think yeah, it, has yeah, to yeah. Be, it, it needs to be discreet and it needs to be tasteful and I think you need to be you know utilizing that data live on the night and just sort of you know, or you know, as you've suggested, maybe sort of a private email. I, I certainly don't think it's an email out to everyone saying, "By the way, we have multiple of these items." So if you're willing to hit these prices, um, then then please do get in touch. I, you know, that has actually happened in the past, and I I personally just don't think it's that tasteful. I think I think it's a, a you know a quick phone call and and utilizing the uh, the data we can provide you with. Absolutely, I 100% agree because you don't want people. You know, at, at you know subsequent events to you know maybe think twice about bidding, knowing they can get a you know maybe better deal or just under the winning bid price after the event. You know, so you want uh, it's you know it, it's 
it may make it specifically it may make sense to uh, contact those people who you know had interest in that package and were bidding and and see if you can work something out but uh, but definitely uh, tread carefully and, and I would agree to be maybe discreet about it uh, yeah yeah Oh, thank you from uh, Nicole she uh, Shaheen. Check your spelling on multiples. I do that all the time. Well, I will adjust my slide, so thank you for that one. <laughs> um, Linda from Linda Pierce. Our event usually has travel in the live auction portion. Do you recommend doing it in the silent auction portion instead? Um, I can just quickly address that. Um, we do, you, absolutely, you can have travel in the, the, the silent auction. The main thing here is just price point. Right. What we've seen, and you might have seen something differently, especially with your your mobile bidding technology, Harry. Um, but you know, kind of for more traditional auctions where it's you know bid sheets, um, you know there is a, a kind of a price point where it gets to be a little bit high for people to be just putting their name down the sheet. And we've seen it kind of get it gets kind of into that red zone above like two thousand, three thousand dollars. Um, but uh, but there's still definitely depends on your audience, right? If you have an audience of, of people that you know are going to be ready for it, then um, then absolutely you should be putting it out. One great place to do it in your silent auction is to have a, a separate section of your of silent auction. It's called the super silent auction. If you guys Google super silent auction, um, you'll see a blog post that we did all about how to do a super silent auction. But it's a separate au silent auction that's uh, maybe roped off or has kind of a a, you know, lights on it or, or something that, that makes it special and that's where you can have your big and best um, silent auction items, typically the ones that maybe didn't make it into the live auction, but uh, they're maybe a little bit, they were too good for the silent auction, but didn't make it into the live auction, so you can have this kind of separate super silent auction. We've seen people would do a lot of uh, successful things with that, especially for travel. And just real quick, uh, just a quick plug uh, for something that we're doing right now with preferred hotels. We do have some lower price point silent auction travel packages that we are um, offering. So if you're interested in that, um, definitely get in touch. We can uh, definitely hook you up. Do you have anything you want to add, Harry? No, that's uh, that, that's you pretty much hit nail on that. I think okay. there's a couple of questions coming in though. Sierra uh, Ramos, Harry, do certain types of events do better with your technology? Gala versus golf event versus dinners versus concerts, etc. Yeah, I mean, we do a huge amount of all of those. Uh, not so many of the concerts, um, but certainly golf days are becoming increasingly more popular and actually using the, the platform that we build that um, they, a lot of the times people will actually use that as their event website, not just the silent auction and the pledging option. So it gives them sort of, you know, information about where to arrive, you know, tea times, that sort of stuff. Um, and that's you know that's hugely popular. The, the bottom line is with Givergy, we we have multiple different systems and services, and I know that I'm going to get shouted at by my marketing team if I get too salesy. Um, <laughs> so well, that's certainly not what I want to be doing right now. I would love to you know present to anyone who is interested in the platform, but very much a part of our role as um, fundraising consultants is learning about your event, learning about your audience, and structuring a platform that's going to be most in line with, with your event. So Golf Days is more or less always mobile, um, so people can be bidding you know, from any, any time pre and, and on the course and so on. Um, a lot of the big gala dinners that we support um, will be just sort of exclusively bespoke tablets on all of the tables. And some events need hybrid, a combination of the mobile and the tablets. Um, so again, it's really up to, it, it, it's part of our consultancy sort of role to, to learn about your event and then structure a presentation or, or a platform that's most geared towards maximizing your return. And, um, you know, I'm more than happy to, to set up a webinar or anyone who's sort of based in New York, I'm more than happy to sort of swing by your office, meet in person and present the system to you. Was that too salesy for you, Ian? I know that actually no, no, that was... my marketing team is going to be <laughs> rolling her eyes going, oh, no, he's off. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's funny. That's a funny lead into the next one. We got a question from Misty Lee who actually is asking about how our packages work and what is the price. Just very quickly, Misty, we have uh, uh, about 200 packages, travel packages that you can check out on our website. They each have a nonprofit price that you can include uh, it in your auction at no, no cost. Anything you raise above that, um, go straight to your cost and no, no surprises there. So that's why it's no risk. Uh, from Rick Gardner, 
Can you think of any other questions to survey our donors with? Uh, you gave an example, where do you want to go? Uh, what are some other questions you can do? Um, you know, you can ask how often they travel. You can ask, um, you know, maybe maybe even put out some options, right? You can say we're thinking about, um, you know, these five travel packages. Where, what is your favorite one to go to? You know, and then see what kind of response you get. Did you, any other ideas you might have, Harry? Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to misadvise anything I, I would say is actually, yeah, a survey would probably, in, in you know, put, the world's a big place, so try and narrow it down to sort of, out of these places, which would you rather go to, um, right. as opposed to sort of, who, who's interested in where, because you'll probably end up with about 200 responses, and obviously okay. you, can't, you, you, you can't please everyone. Um, Right. I mean, there's uh, we've seen people survey just uh, kind of general event information when you're kind of in the planning stages of your event. Um, you know, you might have your kind of VIP constituents that are coming, you know, you know, year after year, and uh, maybe you're looking for new ideas, and you can kind of post those sorts of questions out. Uh, you know, venue-wise or theme-wise. Uh, you know, have some fun with it. Get people involved. People are gonna, if you invest people in the process, people are gonna be more apt to to probably uh, attend your event. Yeah, I think also, um, you know, again, thinking slightly outside of the box, speak to all of your vendors. Vendors typically totally. have the most amount of experience of gala dinners, you know, or you know, or, or or what works, what doesn't work. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, a lot of flower companies right now, if they were listening in, you know, they'd sort of be agreeing with a lot of it because they you know, a lot of them are, are servicing these events week in, week out at the major venues or or any venue really, and and they see what are successful events. They're not necessarily fundraising themselves, but you know, speak to all of your vendors, venues in particular, you know, events staff at venues you know they it's 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 very apparent which events are doing well which events don't which MCs are, are strong which ones aren't you know so you know think slightly outside of the box because all of these people are servicing you know multiple multiple events throughout the year and and very often their experiences can really help that's great another question from Rick Gardner thank you Rick uh, this one's from uh, Nancy Skelly uh, what is the best way to sell not so good items in your auction, especially if they've been donated and you don't want to offend the donor? That's a great question. Uh, you got any thoughts on that, Harry? Anonymous bidding. Anonymous, Anonymous bidding. bidding. Is the, yeah, if people are not, um, if people, particularly if they're not selling at all, um, and you know, very often you have the donor in the room. Um, you know, a lot of our clients will place an anonymous bid. Um, so that on the screen, on the leaderboard screens, projecting who's winning, you know, which item and at what price, and you know, it'll still flash up that there's been a new highest bid on, um, you know, that that painting that no one wants. Um, but it'll say it'll, it, you know, it's an anonymous winner at the moment. So what you don't want is for it not to sell. And the reality is, if it doesn't sell. Um, it, you know, if no one's bidding on it, it's not going to sell anyway. So having an anonymous bid placed by yourself, it, it kind of goes away from from you know the donor losing face on the night. Then you have a, the awkward decision of working out whether or not you actually want to buy the item as an organisation. Uh, right. But that's a, that's a conversation you've got to have offline. Totally. Yeah, and you know, it's it's important to you know I know that there's definitely donors' feelings and uh, uh, to, to take into account, but you know if uh, it's it's also important to be selective about the items that you put out, and you know there's other ways to if it's just that one item you can there's other ways to use items. Um, you know you can bundle them uh, to create packages. I know specifically for artwork, artwork can be um, it's one of those ones that can have a huge splash and make a ton of money, but it can also just fall completely flat and nobody wants it. Um, I know that there's a, a technique that Danny Hooper uh, auctioneer that we partner with uses a lot called the super signature technique where uh, if, if a piece of artwork isn't selling then he'll uh, stop the bidding art pull it and say you know you know this uh, artist here created this piece of artwork um, who would give you know fifty dollars to come sign this piece of artwork on the back and we're going to hang it in a public place you know oftentimes you'll get a lot of participation it's a great way to get people uh, active and moving and 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 uh, he's seen a lot of success on that there's there's some great uh, tidbits on that uh, in some of the other webinars we've done that you can see in, in those recordings. So um, you yeah, can also I, I totally raffle. 
you know, you can also identify items that, you know, if you've got that awkward moment where a committee member is insisting on putting their own personal art into an auction or something, you know, um, equally as cringeworthy that doesn't sell. Um, what, you know, you could put that into a raffle very often, um, you know, before the event to save face, but, uh, you know, also be mindful of not having items that compete with each other. I've seen that time and time again. You know, items that are, you know, similar vacations, you know, they're, they're, they're competing with each other, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, and the most awkward of all um, are sort of experiences that are competing, you know, with, with the, the, the people in the room. I've, I've seen sort of tennis lessons with, with uh, John McEnroe uh, mm. competing with tennis lessons with Tim Henman, and um, there was only one uh -huh. clear winner, and it's kind of awkward when they're both in the room. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, McEnroe was more popular, by the way. For, uh, I don't want to let down any British tennis fans over there, but that's the reality. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, you know, be mindful of not having items compete with each other. And if, and if necessary, if you, if you don't want that awkward moment, you can always put it in a raffle. Totally. Oh, that's a good point, too. Yeah. And you can sell in, yeah, sell in like an online auction after the event's over, too. Um, yeah. <clears throat> this question is from uh, Sharon Lechner. Uh, could you please mention what you recommended as far as the minimum bid should be? Um, minimum bids uh, totally depend, um, uh, are ultimately up to you actually, but I mean for donated items, uh, many industry experts say the best practice is, is to set it at 30 to 40 percent of fair market value. Um, others think it might be, you know, maybe 20 to 25 percent of fair market value to get, you know, to garner interest. Um, I would probably tend towards the higher amount because uh, that way you're guaranteed a return uh, that you're looking for. Um, for consignment items, uh, our rule of thumb is you definitely want to go 20% over the package cost. So if there's a cost associated with an item that you included in your auction, um, set that minimum bid 20% over so that you know that you're going to get a decent return on it, um, and then it'll go up from there. So um, I would recommend you know 30 to 40% of the fair market value. I don't know, Harry, do you have a different recommendation? No, I think that's you know that's that's fair enough. I mean, you, you, some people like to try and put them in super low to just stimulate the the bidding, but actually, I think you're again doing yourself a disservice because people, after a while, when it gets to a more meaningful profit for you, by that stage, people are feeling like they're not getting a great a great return on their investment. So you know, start off that minimum bid with a decent return on that first bid. Um, and then hope that it continues to go up from there. And that way it also completely mitigates against the risk. That's great. A uh, quick question from Lydia uh, Gagnon. Going back to the attendees versus items in the auction, what was the answer? Um, it was half of the number of buying units. It was uh, 75 out of 300. So you want to split your attendees into a number of buying units or couples and then split that in half. And that, that's a good, good target for the number of silent auction items. Um, this question from Amber Holloway, do you have any tips for auctions that are 100% online? Um, well, sorry, was that geared towards me? I, I, I mean, I suppose, uh, yeah, we, um, I guess I don't have a ton of uh, recommendations there other than you can promote the heck out of it using email campaigns. Um, yeah, uh, not too much, but... You know, the online auctions, make, make sure you use a provider um, that is... Um, you know that that the has an act. There's a difference between just an online campaign and an active online campaign where people are, are alerted when they're outbid and so forth. So that's going to sort of generate. It's sort of more self-managing, but at the same time, um, you know, making the most of social media, uh, mm -hmm. building a really Absolutely. structured, a real structured marketing campaign before you've even got the link available um, is absolutely key. So building a, be a beautiful and bespoke website that's going to have, that's full of items is one thing, but actually your the, the real hard work is actually getting eyes to the website, getting right. people engaged. And that, that can be, you know, sending out sort of little, um, you know, little sort of teasers, you know, these three items, are, uh, uh, we've just sourced these three items, the, the auction yep. will be live in a week. Um, or that sort of thing, you know, something that's sort of gentle teasers with email campaigns, social media blasts, running competition, that sort of thing. Absolutely key. Love it. This question from Linda Pierce, how do you politely turn away auction items if there were no bids the same auction in the prior year or if it's donated in the 11th hour? Um, you know, that's a good question. Again, we're kind of talking, we're talking about, uh, you know, the donors' uh, feelings here, right, the ego, but... Uh, 
you know, I, I wouldn't have any problem turning away auction or at least keeping it and saying, you know, we may not be able to put it in this, this event uh, for one reason or another. We already have the lot set, um, but we will absolutely keep it and, and use it, uh, try to figure out another way to use it, right? You're, you're a profit-making uh, uh, entity now, right? So you can get creative with, uh, with other ways to try to use it. It might not fit in the silent auction. It might not fit in the live auction, but uh, maybe it might fit in some sort of contest, raffle, uh, things of that sort, maybe in, like in the uh, online auction, uh, th yeah. things like that. I, I think, sorry, if I can jump in there as no, well, yeah, of course. I think you've absolutely hit you know, nail on the head there, going right back to our first slide. This is a business. You have to manage it as a business, and sometimes you are faced with really difficult decisions in a business, and um, and sometimes you're going to have to put a few noses out and make some, some calls that kind of might upset some people, but the reality is you're doing it for the good of the business. So, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're not just ex filling your auction um, with, with stuff to save face because that degrades the value of the rest of the auction. If you've, you know, if you've got beautiful bespoke trips and fine art and all of these amazing things, if, if you're just adding tat to the, you know, to, to the auction, it actually devalues the rest of the auction. And, and it actually, again, going in line with that, what's the right sweet spot of items to guest ratio, which I think is around about 20%, 25%. Um, particularly for larger events, um, you know, you don't want to just be filling it with a whole load of items that, that you know, aren't cohesive and, and um, you know, it becomes a shopping list at that point and that's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to fill it with items that, yes, have different price points and different, you know, appeals to various demographics but ultimately are all in line and in, in terms of, like, quality. And so, be you know just be ready to make those tough calls and 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 just be you don't have to be too transparent about it you don't want to hurt feelings but it's absolutely okay to turn items down love it um uh, got another question about minimum bids you know how to uh you know i say between 30 and 50% how to determine you know where within that range you know it, it totally it can totally depend on the item it really does um and uh, you know, it's ultimately it's up to you, you and your team. But uh, you know, the balance that you're trying to strike there is uh, you want at least one bid, right? And uh, but you also want uh, you know to to generate enough interest where you get two bids, right? Because that's going to start that that competition. So um, you know, it's it's kind of up to your discretion. Uh, but you also ask, you know, do you discourage listing item values in the description specifically for items such as art and jewelry? I would say yes. I definitely um, try to avoid, uh, um, you know, listing it, it suggested retail value, especially for things like travel, um, because you, you it's, you're trying to pump up that perceived value, not the actual retail value. That retail value, putting that out there, can can oftentimes put a unnecessary glass ceiling in terms of how much people are going to end up bidding because they're always comparing the next bid to that retail value. Um, you know, especially for things like travel, because it can be really hard for people to, you know, price things on the fly there. So the perceived value will be much higher than the actual retail value. Um, for other things where it's, uh, you know, like artwork, uh, maybe bottles of wine are a good example of something where putting the retail value might make more sense because wine is just all over the place, and you know, uh, people just really have no idea or, or compass, uh, you know, where to judge that from. Um, but I, I would definitely avoid, especially in like an auction catalog where people are previewing the items, um, I, I would avoid it. What, what would you say, Harry? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, I was on, I was trying to jump in at one point there and uh, I was on mute. I've, I've seen a, another question come in there about, you know, jazzy display items and, you know, being strategic with where to display. Um, and um, I mean, it, again, it's really, I'm very mindful of the fact that I don't want to be saying every single event is completely unique. Totally. So I need yeah. to be mindful that I'm not making these sweeping statements that all, right. all events are going to respond really well to travel and wine and, you know, all the rest of it. And, you know, the bottom line is like, you know, the broad outline of what we're trying to say here and, you know, making key decisions and, and being being um, assertive on decisions as if it were a business and populating your auction with, with appealing items and is, is, is the bottom line. And, um, you know, it's down, to, it's down to you as a committee 
um, to make sure that you're presenting it in the right way. Um, we love advising as much as we can. Certainly, I can't sort of speak on Winspire sort of you know side of things, but certainly give as you. We love to get involved as actively as we possibly can and give as much. You know, we've got two and a half thousand events under our belt now across different you know various regions. Um, so we love to give advice on. And the great news about us is we have the stats right there as well. It's all very statistical. Um, so we can advise on what's worked well, what hasn't worked so well, and um, you know what, what's led to the most activity. Great. Um, let's see here. We got a bunch of good questions. I don't think we'll be able to answer all of them, but we're going to do our best here. So, um, uh, from Sasa Brunson, uh, how many travel items should a sound auction have? At least 200 people. It totally depends. Um, you don't want it to be all travel. It's, you want it to be, you know, if you have donated travel, um, you know, definitely put that out there first. But you know, you you want at least a, a few out there. But you don't want it to be all travel. You want to have, like as Harry said during the presentation, you want to have a wide variety um, that will appeal to a wide base of people. Um, most popular destinations for Windspire uh, packages that tend to raise the most. Uh, that's super easy. It's it's wine is always a top seller, um, and sports packages are always huge. Um, but that also depends on your audience. Lately, it's been uh, Hamilton Broadway has just been taken off like a rocket. People will pay just about anything for tickets to Hamilton, and so that's just been great. Um, and and, more... and rightly so. I went on Friday. Finally. Oh, you did. Um, you got to go. Yeah, I honestly, I, I've been <laughs> I've been listening to it on repeat ever since. Um, <laughs> I'm absolutely loving it. It was the best show ever, and I can understand why. I mean, I saw I saw VIP tickets sell for twenty thousand dollars at exactly um, at um, the serious fun run re, serious fun event um, re recently, and I was kind of a little bit baffled by that. But then I saw it, and I was like, okay, if I had cash to spare, I would do exactly right. The same. It's fantastic. Well, well, there you go. There's your testimonial for that. So, yeah, for more information on, on packages, definitely get in touch with us. We have plenty of uh, information there for you. Um, there's a, the, go ahead. There's also a chance that we, you know, we can put together a quick blog for for questions that haven't been answered um, totally. afterwards. I'm more than happy to, to get that going in partnership with Winspar as well. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, we do love all these questions coming in. It's great that you're all still awake because, uh, as I said, it's very hard to gauge whether or not people are still still with us or not when there's right. no response from the audience. But uh, I can see a lot of you are still online, which is fantastic. Cool. Well, let's. Uh, I'm going to address just a couple more of these here, and then we'll uh, we'll probably call it a day. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. What are the? Oh, that. This is a good one from Catherine Brown. Um, as far as like how to display items, uh, you know, do you offer display panels? Can you set up on the table? What's the? How many items should you put on a silent auction display table? Uh, first, to answer your first question, Catherine. Yes, we provide eight and a half by eleven. PDFs of all of our experiences that have all the details that the bidders need, and those can be blown up to poster size. Oftentimes, we have people um, doing those, uh, and then plenty of images and descriptions that can be used in bidding technology, like uh, what Harry has with Givergy. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to be promoting the heck out of your items, make them, you know, have some pizzazz there. You know, get creative with the with your displays so that people, you know, it's attractive for people to want. If you just have a you know, a piece of paper with description on it, you know, people are not going to get as excited as if you have pictures. Pictures speak a thousand words, so definitely spend, do your due diligence and, and get, spend the time getting those, uh, those pictures for the promotion. Um, but Harry, what would you say as far as, you know, how many items to have per table? You know, we usually would probably say, you know, four or so on a six-foot table. Yeah, I think I, I've seen events where it's, you know, they've wanted every single item out on display and um, there were sort of 200 items. That, that was actually an event recently and um, it was too confusing. It was too much. It was, um, so, I mean, uh, you know, it, it definitely adds value having something physically there. Um, one thing I would guard against that I do see time and again is, um, is staff members actually, you know, networking the room too much with items, sort of showing them around, showcasing the items. I, th I personally, and this might just be my sort of um, approach or maybe sort of a slightly backward British approach, I think it's just, I don't think it's that tasteful. It feels like you're sort of at a, a it slightly cheapens what you're trying to sell. Um, when you have, um, you know, the, the event staff walking around with these items and sort of thrusting them in people's faces as they're sort of conversing at their dinner table, 
Um, I've seen that happen, and um, I just, I, you know, the bottom line is people do not want to be sold to in any situation. If you feel mm -hmm. that way, then you're going to re you're going to reject it. And so, um, you know, have them displayed beautifully, and allow people to head to them, and encourage them to do so, and and remind them that the the, the, the items are there for review. You know, via MC, or you know, you can use text blast via our platform if that's what you want to do. But um, in my experience, having people sort of dressed up in your in, in, in your sort of branding with items walking around with them sort of displaying them, I, I, I just think it slightly cheapens the event. I really hope I haven't offended a load of people just now, but um, that's just my, my opinion. That's fine. Uh, we're gonna, we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, one from, uh, and for those of you asking about the number of attendees per items, we're going to send out the recording so you can, uh, so you can see that. Um, and then we have one about, um, let me get to your questions, Daza, um, but I had uh, one from Kelly Knack and a couple others about this topic. Uh, with silent, silent and live auctions, should there be a buy now option? If so, when? All the time, special items, what should the percentage increase be uh, for buy now? Um, and I don't, do, do you have anything you'd like to start with on this, Harry, as far as your, what you've seen on buy now? Yeah, I, I personally love the buy it now. Um, we we have the buy it now feature on our platform as well. So when people ask if there's a hundred items, you know, very often like a hundred prints or a hundred autographed something or other, or you know, usually they're slightly smaller packages. It'll be counting down as and when they're bought. One little tidbit that worked really well recently at an amazing event that I loved. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the flower people, the vendors, flower people. Uh, very often events will. Uh, we'll have huge, beautiful flower displays all around the room and on the tables. Um, and at the end of the events, when all said and, uh, said and done, everyone's left, these flowers are often just thrown away. Um, what a client of ours did recently that I thought was genius was they actually sold those off in the buy it now function. Um, so people, instead of making just a quick $50 or $100 donation, love it. they were actually buying the flower display on their tables at 100 bucks each. There were 60 tables, so there's six six grand that wasn't wasn't there otherwise. Um, buy it now for me. I I think they do work well, um, but again, you don't want it to be competing too aggressively with that purchase power in terms of what ratio to items. Um, so usually, buy it now should be sort of fun tippets that people can sort of pick up here and there. True. Yeah, we we've seen people put a buy now price on. We actually have bid sheet templates that uh, we can offer. Uh, with our, that you can actually go download from our website for free that have the buy it now option. You know, sometimes there's a one buy it now uh, space or space for people, three people to enter their names in the buy it now for, you know, consignment items where you can sell it many times. But yeah, what you really got to decide is, you know, uh, you know, what is that price that, that uh, is above the package cost that would, you'd be just very excited about uh, getting that bid and um, you know and then setting that buy it now price you know it could be 50 percent over uh, the cost uh, if it's a donated item maybe it could be fair market value um, it's, it's really ultimately up to you um, but the, the point here is is you know you want to make sure that if someone does put their name in that buy it now spot especially if you can only sell one uh, you're really happy with the result and you don't think the, the bidding could have gotten much higher uh, time for one more question um, from Zaza Brunson. Uh, do you suggest a, an auction list or guest to look at their table during an entertainment speaker dinner, like an auction catalog? Um, totally. I mean, if that's taken care of with uh, Givergy's you know, platform, that, that will be always displaying on the you know, screens. Uh, but you can absolutely create an auction catalog um, to, for people to preview the items before the event. We actually have a, a template on our website that you can go and download for free and, and create that yourself uh, uh, as well as other resources. So go check that out. Um, but yeah, uh, did you want to add anything else there, Harry? No, that's, uh, that, that's pretty much it for me so far. Great, guys. Well, with that, I want to thank all of you. Um, thank you, Harry, so much for uh, joining us here today, and thanks to you all for joining us uh, for this webinar. Um, this is not going to be the last, so please stay tuned. Um, we will definitely be uh, re revisiting this uh, at a later date. So uh, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll be sending out an email with the recording uh, and a little bit of a post-webinar or post -webinar survey. Um, if you have any questions or your questions weren't answered, please let us know. Um, as Harry mentioned, we'll probably put together a little something that, um, that addresses all of them in due time. So uh, with Great. that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, uh, you know, appreciate all of your time. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care, and uh, we'll see you next time.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.